What's good, YouTube? It's your boy, JR Sports. We're back with another Charger video today. Today, we're going to discuss Tom Telesco's end of the year press conference. If you didn't get to watch the full hour thing, I got you. We're going to go over all the key points. We're going to go over what exactly he said. What does that mean for his team's future? And I'm going to give a little, I'm going to sprinkle in a little bit of my opinions in there. But you already know what it is. Let's get into it. Let's waste no time because this video is going to be a long one. So grab your popcorn, grab your food, grab your snacks, grab a drink, sit down because we're going to dive into it. Before we get into the video, if you want to support me, all I really need you to do is drop the like button. I don't know how you found my video, but I'm grateful you're here watching to help others find my video and to help other Chargers fans find my video as well. Just drop a, drop a like, hit the like button. Just to, to start out, just how would you assess uh, Brandon's first season as head coach? Yeah, I think he, he handled things very well this year. Um, it's great working with them, great working relationship. Um, but uh, I think you guys can tell too. I mean, you know, he really has a great connection with our team and with our players. I think you saw that on a daily basis. And uh, he has definitely brought an identity to this football team, um, which is step number one as you come in as a, uh, as a new head coach. There, so. He says he fe he's happy with Staley, his relationship with players. I agree with that. I personally felt that some of the players didn't like Anthony Lynn going to last year. Uh, we actually saw what happened with Desmond King, the burnout between that relationship that ended up with us trading away Desmond King, who would have been a huge asset for the team this year. So I do see what you see, what he means there with that Staley has a good relationship with his players. I also do agree that he brought an identity to this team. I felt like last year with Anthony Lynn, we were known as a team that was choking away late leads, um, couldn't finish games. Uh, we're, like, I guess we we're trending to see how we would outcharge ourselves every week. This year, I think Staley did a good job for a first-year head coach to go nine and eight. His decision makings were kind of shaky, not necessarily the decision makings, but the play calls that were being called on critical situations. I think that's my biggest issue with Staley. But he did bring a identity to this team, an identity that we're exciting. We're here to play aggressive, and we're here to win. We're not playing to lose. So I do agree with Telesco on what he has to say about Staley this season. Uh, and then just specifically with his decision making, obviously a, a change in terms of how aggressive, you know, the team was on fourth down. Just for you, how supportive are you of, of, of that approach? And how did you feel like that sort of materialized this season? Yeah, um, I love the identity that we play with. I really do. Um, I support him 100%. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in using data to, uh, data to make decisions. Um, as is he, and it doesn't mean that there isn't context involved in that. I mean, we're not robots, um, but we're trying to put our players in position of strength. And Had to pause it right there right quick again. Like I said, I agree with them. We're The identity of this team is we're aggressive, we're playing to win, are we going to take risks? But did you hear what he just said? He said we want to put our players in situations to win. And I think that was the biggest issue with my well, my issue with whoever was calling the play calls on offense when we're going for it on fourth downs is that ball needs to be in Justin Herbert's hands because he's our best player. You should not be handing the ball off to Joshua Kelly or to Justin Jackson. You put the ball in Justin Herbert's hands and you let him make the play, whether it's a pass or with his legs. I think we forget or this team forgets that Herbert is mobile. Like, did you guys not watch the Rose Bowl? Like, let this man get the fourth down conversion. And you know what? If he doesn't get it, I will still be mad. I, most of us will still be mad. But we're going to know, you know what? The ball was in our best player's hands. Hey, uh, Tom, uh, going off what you said earlier, you know, you mentioned the future is bright for this team. You got a, a good quarterback. You like the coach. But, uh, you know, going into your 10th season as a GM now, you know, why hasn't it worked in years past? You know, you know, so many years with this team. Not enough wins, not enough playoff appearances. Is any kind of pinpoint to why the progress hasn't been as much as you would like to? Yeah, that's such a general question to say that. Obviously, we haven't gone to the playoffs as much as we would have liked. Tom Telesco's tenure, we've only been to the playoffs twice, guys. Twice. So, we haven't been to the playoffs as much as we'd like to. Duh. Tell us something we don't know. Um, but each season is really unique in its own. Uh, when I talked to the team the day after the, the Raiders game, um, the one thing I told to them, certainly for guys like Joey Bosa and Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler, guys that have been here a while, you know, this was year one. This was year one with this football team, year one with Brandon Staley, year one in a stadium 
full of our fans, you know, not an empty stadium, you know, a, you know, so um, we're going to build on this year. I'm not so much concerned what happened in years prior, really just concerned on 2021, how, what happened, how it happened, how we can get better next year. Um, but yeah, I see this more as a beginning than anything else. All right, so this is my biggest issue with Tom Telesco. Tom Telesco is like that girlfriend, that boyfriend. I don't know whoever's watching this, whatever you like, you like. But he's like that significant other that you're ready to let go. You're ready to be like, yo, I'm done with you. And they always know what to say. And they have a way with words that makes you believe like, okay, I'm going I'm to believe in you again. I'm going to give you another shot or whatever just for them to let you down. And that's what Telesco is. He has a way with words. Like if you listen to, his, to what he's saying... Everything he's saying makes perfect sense. Like, we're going to build off this year. You know, we're not looking to the past. We're looking at this year. We have a good core group. We have a bright future. And But we've heard that before. We've heard that before. So, like, he's like that stingy girlfriend that never changes. And with such a good uh, core group, like you mentioned, Keenan and uh, Bosa and, and Justin, does that make you want to be a little more aggressive to kind of get this window and get a Super Bowl soon, like in the, in the next one or two years, you know, aggressive with the trades? I know, I know you spend money in the free agency. Uh, but in terms of kind of trades and stuff like that, do you want to be a little more aggressive, kind of capitalize on this window? I don't believe in windows, but we're in this to win it every year. So if that's the window, then this that's man fine. just said that he does not believe in windows. What? Every team has a window. Everybody who is in the playoffs right now mostly are in their window other than the Bengals. The Bills, they're in their window. The Bucks were in their window. The Niners are in their window. And that window is going to be long because of the way the management handles it. So the Rams are in their window. Their window started with Jared Goff, and they're still in their window right now with Matthew Stafford. So this whole thing that he doesn't believe in windows, it's nonsense. Like, what do you mean you don't believe in windows? Every team has a Super Bowl window. We're about to enter our Super Bowl window. So for him to say that already, it's like, what? What are you saying, bro? Like, what? Um, I don't know if uh, making a trade will win a Super Bowl for us. If it's there and it will help, sure. Um, I feel like we've been aggressive. It may not have been the aggressive that, that you think um, is there, but um, you know we've used free agency. We've been selective with it, obviously. You guys kind of see where we are with that. I just don't believe no matter what cap space you have, you can't build a team through free agency. You can certainly supplement it. Um, you know, we were aggressive with Corey Lindsley last year. Like I said, we've always been selective with it more than anything else to supplement our roster. All right, all right. I got to stop it right there because there's a lot to go through right there. So you heard this man first off say that he believes they've been aggressive. I don't know what aggressive means to him, but there's one definition of aggressive in the dictionary. And let me tell you, we've been far from it. Has he? And he said it himself. He's been selective with his free agents. And a lot of that is due to that he's been, he hasn't had the cap space he's needed to be able to be aggressive. But for him to straight up lie and say, yeah, we've been aggressive, it's nonsense. It's not true. Like, who have we gone after that we've been aggressive? If you guys can name one player aside from Corey Lindsley that we've been aggressive to go after, then I'll, I'll stay quiet. We have not been aggressive in any free agency. And no, a trade is not going to win you a Super Bowl, but it's adding pieces to your team to win a Super Bowl. But it's not only a trade, like it's free agent acquisitions during the season, people that get cut. The Rams added Odell. The Titans added linebacker McKinney that helped their defense. So these are not just, we're not expecting a trade to win us a Super Bowl. We're expecting a trade or a move to help us forward it within the season to get better. Like you got to be blind to not see that teams are running it down our throat. You did nothing during the season. You just said, hey, you're going to live or die with your players. And that's not what's going to get done. Teams that want to win, teams that want to win a Super Bowl, teams that make moves, they go out. I mean, teams that want to get better, they make a move during in season. Whether that be free agent acquisitions during the season that people get cut. But we've never done any of that. I can't remember the last player we brought in in season. I can't remember the last player we traded for. So whatever this guy is saying right now is just, it doesn't, give me vibes that we're going to change this off season. It's like, we're going through the same repetitive cycle over and over again. And uh, Tom, another question. Uh, Mike Williams had a, a career year uh, with uh, Brandon Staley and the coaching staff, Joe Lombardi, uh, but he's scheduled to be a free agent in the off season. Uh, is he a priority for you to resign him uh, uh, in the coming months or weeks? Yeah, well, well, we'll get into 2022 and that plan soon, but I'll tell you this with, with Mike, um, so happy and grateful we drafted him. Um, you know, obviously his first year with us is really a medical redshirt. 
But, and I know I've said this before, every time he's had an opportunity to make a play for us, he does. So I, I, I didn't see this as, as a one-year thing with Mike this year. Um, his second year in the year, he had 10 touchdowns. Uh, his third year, he had 1,000 yards and led the league in yards per catch. So, and then this coming year where we knew he's going to have more targets, we're going to expand uh, where we use him on the field, and he produced again, you know, career year and catches and yards. So um, he's had a great early career for us. How much does he deserve to get paid? I think that's a topic that many many of us are wondering. For me personally, I think Mike Williams is a – he's not a top 10 receiver, but he's on the top 15 – I mean top 10, like on the outskirts of the top 10 towards the top 20. But that doesn't matter. It's the chemistry he has with Justin Herbert that matters here. It's what he does for this team that matters here. He stretches the field for us. He's a deep threat. That's the only thing he could really do for us. He's not a playmaker. He's not a route runner. But just the ability to stretch the field helps this offense a lot. I think this comes down to how much he wants. Does he want top of the dollar money? I don't think Telasco is going to pay him. Is he trying to come back on a team-friendly deal? I think he stays here for another four to five years. So we'll see. I mean, he, did, he didn't really tip his card on what he's thinking. He did praise him a lot. But he never said, like, hey, Mike Williams is going to come back next year. So we're going to have to wait and see on this one how this plays out. I think the tag might be an option here, but I'm not for him getting tagged. I think it's better to work out an extension with him, a team deal, because like I said, he's not a top 10 receiver in my eyes, but it's the value he brings to this team that matters. So it's Telesco's going to have to work on this Next year's team will be different than this year's team. And that's, you know, the one thing as we do look to 2021 or 2022, and if you get one takeaway from this is, you know, we're going to focus on the whole complete team going into next year. It's not, there won't be one side of the ball. There won't be one position group. There won't be one position. It's a complete look at the football team. And we're not just going to look at the offense and say, well, it was a top five offense. So we're all set there and we're just going to look other places. It just doesn't work like that. It's just too complacent. Um, it's going to be a different team next year. We're not going to have the same exact 11 starters on offense and defense. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a total team focus as we move in through this offseason to get us where we need to be. God, I had to stop it right there again. I mean, our offense was top five this year. What do you got to look at? I mean, yeah, we need a right tackle. We need a playmaking wide receiver, in my opinion. But good teams focus on their weakness. Their weak, our weakness is our defense. So, like, yeah, it's cool to say you're going to look at the whole team. But <laughs> realistically, like, yo – you need to focus on our defense. Like, it's obvious we're going to have 22 different starters. Like, not everybody's going to be back. Like, duh. But, like, for you to say, like, oh, like, we're not just going to look at one position group. We're not just going to look at one part of the team. It's like, you, maybe you should, bro. That's what good teams do. The Bills three years ago, they knew their defense was great. They knew what they had in Josh Allen. What did they do? They focused on their offense. They went to go get Stephon Diggs. They went to go get Cole Beasley. They brought in weapons to supplement their weakness of their team. And that's what good teams do. The Chiefs last year, for example. You know what? Let's take it back to the Chiefs Super Bowl year. Their offense was electric. Yo, our defense is trash. What did they do? Brought in a new defensive coordinator. Brought in defensive pieces. They brought in Tyron Matthew. They brought in a bunch of defensive pieces to help that weakness of their team. Another example of this is you guys, you know, like we, yeah, we count on the Cowboys and all, but they did the same thing and they made the playoffs, whether they, yes, they lost, but our team hasn't even made the playoffs. So I'm using examples of teams who have focused on one side of the ball, knowing that their other side of the ball is their strength. So this is what this team needs to do. This is what winning teams do. And Telesco was over here telling us, yeah, uh, we're not going to focus on just one side of the ball. Like, yo, bro. Yes, you need to focus on one side of the ball. One side of our, our offense was ranked top five. Our defense was ranked bottom five. It's simple mathematics here, simple ranking system. So, like, come on, get it together. We're trying to win a Super Bowl within this window. Hey, good morning, Tom. Um, want to ask you about your, your thoughts on aggression, um, aggressive play calling. Uh, clearly, you guys – talked about this in the off season, but was there a point any time during the season that you revisited this topic? Put it this way. I trust our head coach 100%. Uh, I really do. He is a reason for everything that he does. Um, and it is backed in, in, in research as well. Um, 
I want to play aggressive football. Uh, you know, being here in Los Angeles, obviously our number one goal is to win, okay? 1A is to entertain on the way to winning. And if you watch us play this year, I, I think it'd be hard pressed to say that we're not an exciting football team. All right, bro. Do you want to play aggressive football, but you don't want to be aggressive in free agency? Like, this is not a one-way street, bro. You got to get it together. Like, you be aggressive in free agency. You set the tone right off the bat in the offseason. Yo, we are coming. And that's going to lead to an aggressive football team. Like, yeah, I just said our identity is we're an aggressive football team on the field. But what we're doing off the field in regards to our general manager and our front office is we've been far from aggressive, far from aggressive. So if we get that aspect of if you want, if you really mean Tom Telesco, that you want to be an aggressive football team, show it, show it, show it this offseason, aggressive this offseason. It's going to reflect on this team on the field and on the record and how far we make it next year. So stop talking and actually do it. What would you say to fans who have lost patience with with you specifically? Just, you know, you're going into your 10th year, I believe, right? Here. What, just who would say, how can they keep doing the same thing? The team's won, hasn't won enough playoff games, haven't, hasn't done enough. Yeah, I understand. Um, I think if you watch our team on the field this year, objectively, like I said, I think it's hard to look at this team and not be excited for, for the future. Um, we play an exciting brand of football. We have a lot of playmakers on the field. We're not that far away. I mean, mid-December, we're playing for a division lead, okay? But when our best was needed, our best was needed late in the year, we just didn't quite have it, which is why we weren't in the playoffs. Um, so I understand the fan frustration. Uh, hold really up, hold up, hold up. It's hard to be excited for this season, upcoming season, because of you, bro. Like, like we as fans, we are not dumb. With Anthony Lynn, we went 12-4. and four made the playoffs, we were expecting, you know, okay, this is the start. We're about to skyrocket up. What happened the next season? We had a top seven pick. So, like, this is nothing new for us. Like, if we can't get excited. Obviously, we're impatient. Like, you keep doing the same thing over and over again. You try to draft. You think you're a draft expert, but you're really not. And then we just have a mediocre season. Like, we're tired of being mediocre. Of course, we're impatient. And, of course, it's hard for us to get excited for the next season when you've shown constantly that you can't get us over the hump. So, I mean, what exactly do you want us to be patient with? It's been 10 years, 10 freaking years of you not being able to. We have two playoff appearances and you want us to be patient. Nah, bro, we can't be patient. You need to, you need to, you're lucky Dean Spanos is, doesn't know how to run a football team because a good a good owner would have fired you a long time ago. Um, I'll take the responsibility that our defense did not play up to the expectations that we had for them. Um, as I looked at this team, moving the defense moving into this year, um, certainly knew it was going to be a different scheme, new system, new coaches. Um, but I felt like at all three levels, we had a playmaker or playmakers at all three levels, plus with high football character, high football intelligence, it should be pretty seamless. Okay. But I can't argue with, with the numbers. I mean, you know, we were bottom five in most points allowed, bottom five on third down, bottom five in red zone. Those are pretty key categories. And you know, a lot of times it's some things that take no talent, you know, alignment, assignment, and technique. Um, it's three things that any player can do. And so y'all heard it himself. He said the defense was bad. We were top bottom five in almost every defensive category. So where exactly is Brandon Staley? You hired a defensive guru. You were supposed to put these play these pieces that you drafted in a position to succeed, and somehow we were worse than last year. We were worse. So that doesn't add up to me. Assignment, alignment, technique. All right, let's not kid ourselves, guys. All these guys are NFL players. They're in the NFL because they're darn good at what they do. They may be the worst player on our team, but they're in the NFL because they're good at what they do. So for them to not know their assignment, for them to not know their alignment, and for their technique to not be where it should be, I'll come down to coaching. So our coach needs to do a better job at putting these players in positions to succeed. And that's something that Brandon Silly didn't do. Let's keep it a buck. We fired our special teams coach because our special teams was trash. And I, now I'm not saying fire Staley. I'm not saying fire Staley. But we do got to look at him closely. Yo, you didn't put our, position, our players in positions to win. It is what it is. Learn from it.
But let's not sugarcoat things. It is what it is. That's what happened. So, Tom Telesco knows the defense was trash. So, now it's up to Staley. This offseason is really up to Staley to get this defense running with the pieces, the right pieces that Telesco needs to get. Are you going to be looking for other different characteristics or anything, you know, in this as you look to, re, you know, kind of retool the roster? Is, are you looking for different things in, in the past? Is there something with Brandon's? Uh, sure, there, that... there'll, be, there'll be some different things. Anytime you change coordinators or change head coaches, there are going to be maybe some different characteristics you're looking for. Um, but, yeah, there's going to be some addition and subtraction to this football team, not just on the front, but, pro, you know, in all three, fa all three levels. It's just kind of natural. He's saying we're going to look for players that fit Brandon Staley's defense. That's a good thing. You got to provide your good coach you got with the player he needs, right? Now, for me, I'll get into this a little bit later because he talks about Michael Davis later. But don't be surprised if Michael Davis gets cut because you heard it himself. We're going to look for additions and subtractions on all three levels, not just the front, to fit what Staley needs. So... We'll get into Michael Davis a little bit later. Hey, Tom, uh, you mentioned that, you know, you overestimated, you felt like you overestimated what you had defensively. Was that overestimating the, you know, talent that you had starting, you know, outside of those, you know, Derwin and, and, and Joey and those star players? Was it overestimating, you know, the depth that you had after, you know, going through some attrition? Was it overestimating, you know, how the pieces would fit in to the new scheme? Is it a combination of sort of... All it was more that the, the, the transition, I thought the transition would be more seamless and quicker than it was. I um, actually thought we'd be a little bit, would take much longer on offense than defense. Um, but that's kind of how it worked out. Um, on the overall football team, I don't, didn't see a, a depth issue. You did not see a depth issue. I mean, when well, you're not watching the games, Tevon Campbell was getting burned every time we touched the field. Our interior defensive tackles were getting pushed on every critical third and fourth down. So you did not see a depth issue. What games were you watching? We clearly have a depth issue when we don't have good backups to step in. So, again, tell us go back at it with those lies. Like, quit lying. Like, just be honest. Yo, this team wasn't, it didn't perform to the expectations I had. And a lot of it is because I failed. If he said that, I would. If he said that, I guarantee you, a lot of Charger fans would give him hats off, because it's the truth. I was talking to Brandon a couple of weeks ago, you know, he said he, you know, he felt like, you know, offensively, just the way that you guys were structured cap wise, there was a real opportunity to sort of overhaul that side of the ball heading into this season. Obviously, you guys, you know, signed three new starting offensive linemen, you know, drafted Rashawn, um, and he said he felt like defensively with the way, you know, the number of free agents you guys have, that you guys have a similar opportunity to sort of affect that side of the ball. And I know you're looking at, you know, the complete team, but just how much of an opportunity is there here defensively to maybe bring in more players who, who fit what Brandon's trying to do better. Yo. So I want y'all to pay attention. Bannon Staley is not a, he's not fronting. He said, yo, we need an overhaul on the defensive front. You heard Daniel pop just say that Bannon Staley said this, said this. So now I want you to listen to Tom Telesco's response. Listen closely to what he says. You can't take your focus off the full football team. You just can't. I'm not going to look at the offense and just say we're all ready to go. So um, it's a complete look, a balanced look. But uh, it's going to be a complete balanced look at this football team. Um, that's the way you have to build it. You just can't rely on one side of the ball. It was good last year. We'll be fine moving forward. Um, certainly there will probably be some change on defense, but that's kind of natural. Um, and I think there's a lot of players here that fit in just fine. Um, but it may take a little bit more. Tommy, time. we're not asking you to take your eyes off the full team. We're asking you to take a closer look at the defense because it's trash. I don't know how many times we have to tell you this. Like, what games are you watching? Your head coach is telling you, yo, we need defensive players. And you're over here telling me, oh, no, we have to look at the full team. We're going to take our eyes. We're not asking you to. We're just telling you, look at the defense. It's trash. Like, it's simple. It is garbage defense. You need to bring in players for this coach to be successful. And if he's telling you that and you're contradicting it in the press conference, uh, what is going on here? You already got two different perspectives on this offseason. It's not looking pretty for us. And then he has the audacity to say it's going to take some time. How much time? It's nine years. Herbert's on his rookie deal. This is the time to fully take advantage of this window that you don't believe in. So how much more time do you need, Tommy? 
you need another nine years. You need Herbert to end up like Philip Rivers. Like, how much more time do you need? And then just when you're mentioning some of the pitfalls defensively, the one thing you didn't bring up was the was the run defense. And just talking to Brandon, he mentioned that, you know, bolstering defensive line and the defensive front is, he said it's going to be at the center of our approach um, this offseason. Are you, are you aligned in that? What do you think happened with the, with the run defense? And just how much work do you think there is to do on that defensive line to improve in stopping the run? Yeah, I mean, I mean the run defense has to improve. Um, I think he also said run defense is, is 11-man unit. It's about run fits. It's a lot like playing, bas- playing defense in basketball in, in the NBA. It's, it's much less one-on-one defense. It's more team defense. Um, and that's just the way that it is. Uh, we had a lot of stretches this year that the players that are out there did some pretty good things. Uh, but we weren't, very, we weren't consistent enough by any means. So, but we got to take a good look at that. And we got to get better. There's no doubt about that. Some of it's alignment assignment technique, some of it's personnel, um, and some of it's just being the second year of the defense. Um, run defense is very important. Um, we can't be bottom five in anything. Um, pass rush and coverage are um, probably a little more important to me, but we have to get to that point, and getting that point is being able to stop the run when you need to stop the run. Um, we did in different parts of the season, but just not nearly consistent enough. Again. Ideally, what you'd want, I mean, what I'd want as a Chargers fan is what my coach what my coach is saying to be aligned with what my GM is saying. That's not happening. Telesco seems like, you know, I don't care what Staley told you. That's not what we're going to do. We need a better defensive tackles. And when our head coach knows it, but you're deciding to say that you don't acknowledge it, that right there is a problem for me yeah, already. Some groups on offense step up when we needed them. Um, you know, we went – Essentially nine deep on the offensive line. Uh, we lost our right guard, right tackle early in the season. Um, that group did tremendously, the, the front. You know, that offensive line, we threw for 5,000 yards, ran for 1,800 yards. We ran the ball when we had to run it, which is the fourth quarter of games we had to lead. We held the ball for like four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes sometimes with, that, with those five offensive linemen. Um, our sack numbers were top five least allowed. Our pressures allowed were top five least allowed. And that's from that whole group of five. That's not just all Rashawn Slater or Corey Lindsley. That's all five of those guys. So really proud of that group. I'm proud of the tight end group. So yeah, hats off to Tom Telesco this offseason, solidifying our offensive line. Yes, we did give up the least amount of sacks. One of the mo- We were on the top of the least amount of sacks. But imagine what this offense would have been able to do if we had a, start- a, start- a starting worthy right tackle to protect Justin Herbert. A lot of those... Not a, lo- a lot of the fact that we didn't give up a lot of pressure is due to Justin Herbert being able to move in the pocket. So let's not fool ourselves. Justin Herbert's mobility helped this team, which is a good thing. But imagine if we had a starting right tackle that's not a backup, that's not hurt, and that could solidify the right side of this offensive line for Justin Herbert in this offense. So I think that's another thing that Telesco needs to address this offseason. He can't just be complacent with the fact that this offensive line made huge strides from the offensive line we've had before. If he gets a right tackle, I think this offense could be the best offense in the league next year. Now, in regards to the tight end group, I said this before the season started. I have no clue why we brought in Jared Cook. Jared Cook dropped a lot of critical balls, and I'm a big fan of Farham. So I think it's time we actually give Farham the starting tight end job and rotate in McKitty because that's what you drafted him for, right? And let go of Jared Cook, who is a free agent this offseason. Is it you, are you looking at your free agents first or are you looking at outside uh, free agents that can help you bolster your, your depth at different positions? Yeah, great, great question. Um, if you follow us long enough, you can kind of see what our philosophy is. We'd rather draft and develop our own and sign our own where we can. We know it can't be everybody, but that's our desire. Um, we have a lot of cap space this year. It doesn't change how we'll approach free agency. Um, I mean, we have to budget for the future. We right, so Tom Telesco just said that our philosophy is to draft and develop players. If you guys could name me a player aside from Joey Bosa, Keenan Allen, who we've drafted and re-signed and is still part of this team from Telesco's draft class, you got me. Go ahead. Just name him. A player we drafted and developed in Telesco's tenure that is still on his team in nine years. Go ahead. Let me tell you something. Tom Telesco has not been able to draft and develop players throughout his whole tenure. So we got to stop 
we got to stop with this, yo, built through the draft, built through the draft. No, we're not going to be able to do that because we haven't been able to do that with the past nine years. So it's time for a switch of philosophy because if we're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're going to be in the same place over and over again. Very difficult. The draft is much easier um, in that regard. So, But we have to pair them both. You just can't try and just draft your way through this. You have to add through free agency. Um, so that's part of it. But you know, our philosophy, you know, kind of is what it's been. It's probably what it will be moving forward. Doesn't mean we're not aggressive with it, um, but we're selective with it, and we think it works. With Tom Telesco, and we're not even into the season already. We have a lot of money this off season, but we're not gonna do anything different. That's basically what he just said. What do you mean you're not gonna do everything different this off season when you have top three cap space in the NFL? Usually, teams that are in a position, we just went nine and eight. We have money in the offseason. Usually, teams take advantage of the of that specific offseason to enter their Super Bowl window, a window he said he doesn't believe in, remember? So, I'm already done with Telesco, and the season hasn't even started. Maybe he's bluffing. Maybe he's bluffing. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But I'm not really looking forward to the next season, guys, based on what he's saying on this presser. He says it's easier to find players in the draft, but that's something he hasn't been able to do as well either. So how are we going to reward our own if we can't get players that deserve to be rewarded? And when you do, when they do deserve to get rewarded, they walk away, like Hunter Henry, Denzel Perriman. So this doesn't add up to me. Like a lot of the things he's saying, like I'm telling you guys, he knows how to talk. But when you look closely at it, it doesn't add up. And that's the story of Tom Telesco the past nine years. Or do you feel like you need an upgrade there to, to you know, strengthen the offensive line as a whole? Well, to see how it plays out. We'll just see how things play out. But he went in and really battled for us. He'll continue to get better. Um, certainly helps the depth of our offensive line to have someone like him step in and play how he did. Is every player on your offense going to be an all-pro or a pro bowler? That's not the case. Um, will we have competition on that side of the, of the line? More than likely, I would say so. So I don't think we're really into giving people positions right now. Our right tackle situation is a mess. Storm Norton, he's a solid backup. I'm not going to talk bad about him. You can't expect them to, you know, come in and be a freaking all-star pro-level player when he came from the XFL and the CFL. We did trap we did a draft Trey Pipkins, who had us. He actually popped out of the screen on some games, but I don't think he's a starting worthy right tackle. And then if you guys paid attention, Tom Telesco didn't mention Bulaga. So that lets me know that he's getting cut, and that actually makes me happy because Bulaga has just been a waste of money on this team. So he did mention we're going to have a competition to, for the right tackle spot. I expect the way Tom Telesco is, I expect him to bring someone from free agency on a cheap veteran deal, coupon Tom style, to compete. I just hope that it's someone who could actually play the right tackle position at a average level. Anything below average, we're going to have the same results. If we get an average right tackle, this offense will be the best offense in the league, I guarantee you guys. So... I guess I'm just happy that we know Bulaga's not going to come back because he didn't mention him at all throughout that whole question. If he said, you know, you know what, well, Storm Norton was in there because Bulaga was hurt, but we expect Bulaga to be healthy next year, then I would have been panicking. But he did not mention Bulaga once, so that's good news for us. Yeah, I love Chenna. Um, he produced in the last game, he produced in this game. It doesn't matter what scheme you play, he's going to produce. Um, love how he plays, love the tempo he plays at, love his toughness. Um, he's a playmaker. He was a playmaker in college. He's been a playmaker with us. He closed out a playoff win against the Ravens with a strip sack of Lamar Jackson against Orlando Brown. It's a good tackle. It's a good quarterback. He made a huge play for us, won that game, and he's done that for us. Um, so we'll see how things play out. But, uh, um, yeah, there's really no part of his game that I don't like, and I love him as a person too. I mean, that, those are the type of guys you build around. He basically asked him, yo, is New Orleans about to get paid? Contrary to what he said when we asked Mike Williams, he said, yo, we're going to look at Mike Williams in the offseason. He said, these are the type of players you build around in regards to Nwosu. So I expect us to pay Nwosu, but the question is, how much is Nwosu really worth? For me, I think Nwosu is a good rotation piece. He's not someone I would break the bank on. He's a great player, but he doesn't flash out of the screen like Melvin Ingram did. When we had Melvin Ingram and Joey Bosa coming off the edges, we had a dynamic duo coming off the edge. Ochenna Nwosu hasn't showed me he could be a dynamic duo with Joey Bosa. 
yeah, he popped out the screen against the Raiders. Crazy. He's a great player. I want to have him back, but at the right price. He's not someone that, like I said again, that I would break the bank on. I would pay him, just not top, 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 top money. So I'm all for bringing back Nwosu, but again, it's going to be on a team-friendly deal. Not necessarily team-friendly, but let's not get too crazy with paying Nwosu. But I guarantee you he's going to get paid just based off of what Telesco said in the presser. He didn't say the same thing about Mike Williams. That's a player you will try to build around. But he said that about Nwosu, so that tells me off the bat we are going to pay Nwosu. Tom, what are your thoughts about Michael Davis' season? Brendan has talked to us about how you know, Michael at times kind of struggled. He was asked to do more in this scheme and kind of he just struggled in certain aspects in this scheme. What, what are your thoughts on how we, the season he had and just kind of, you know, obviously last year you guys signed him to a, an extension. So um, just how are you feeling about his progress right now? Yeah, well, Jeff trying to stay balanced with this because he made a lot of plays for us too. Okay. But I acknowledge that, yeah, there, there were some struggles out there as well. Um, Michael is similar to what I just said about some other guys. Like, we love his skill set and we love his makeup. So when Michael came here from BYU as an undrafted free agent, um, Ryan Miles and Gus Bradley really did a great job developing him, his skills, and how he played in, in, in the last defense and what they asked him to do. And it really took off. And by the time he got to the end of his contract, he really turned into a really good starter in this league. Now a change of defense, different things are asked of him. So there's going to be a learning point here. He was a developmental player when he came in. Um, he's well past that at this point. But this is, a, you know, we're, we are asking him to do some things that are different than what he's done in the past. Remember I told you guys we are going to come back and talk about Vato. So when we paid Vato last offseason, I was against it. And I'm going to tell you guys why. You heard Tom Telesco say Gus Bradley and his staff developed Michael Davis. Michael Davis was developed in a cover three scheme and he struggled in a cover three scheme as our cornerback too. So he struggled. He was getting burned in zone coverage. We made a transition to Brandon Staley, who plays a lot of man coverage. So for me, it didn't make sense for us to pay a corner who struggled in zone coverage to be our cornerback one in a man, man coverage scheme. And we saw the results this year. I mean, I'm not saying Vato had a horrible season. He did not. But he did not have a court, he did not have a cornerback one season. He is not a lockdown corner that he could put on an island. Is he a good player? Yes. Is he as good as what he's getting paid though? He's definitely not. So I expect. Well, I mean, it'd be. I'd hope that we either rearrange that contract for him to reflect that he's a cornerback too in the scheme, or we just let him go. I love Vato. I love the Mexican roots in him. But I, this is a performance-based sport. And he's not performing like a cornerback one. Like, let's keep it a buck. The contract, it's a horrible contract for a cornerback two. So hopefully Tom Telesco can restructure that contract. I said it since last season. He is not a cornerback one. He struggled in cover three, like I just said. He's not going to do good in a man-to-man -man scheme. And that showed so and Vato's already on his contract. Like he just had a contract year. So how much more can we expect him to develop later into his career? So it is what it is. He's a cornerback too. Let's pay him like a cornerback too. So that's basically that was basically all of the press conference. I mean the most important part of the press conference. I said what I said in regards to everything he said. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I'm feeling a little shaky about this off season simply because. A lot of Daniel Pop's questions, he was bringing up what Staley said, and then we got Telesco either ignore it or say something different. So ideally what we want is our GM and our head coach to be on the same page, and maybe they are. For all we know, maybe they are. But based off of this presser, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Like, There's no reason why Joe Burrow and the Bengals should be in the playoffs, and we shouldn't be. And if we fully expect for Justin Herbert to be successful – then we need our defense to get better, and we need our GM to be better. So, I mean, I'd like to know what you guys think. What do you guys think about what I said? What's your opinion on the presser? What's your overall opinion on Telesco? And before you do any of that, don't forget to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, turn on the bell notification to let, so I can let you know when the videos go up. And that's all. I'm out.